Hi everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology. We're continuing with Unit 2 Multicellular Organisms today and we're going on to Key Area 4 which is Variation and Inheritance. So this is a key area that often people find quite tricky so I really recommend that you go through these notes, there'll be a lot of new terminology being thrown at you and try and take some notes, highlight the bits that I highlight and give a go at the calculations that appear later on. So to start off with, we are going to talk about the concept of variation. So what variation is, is the differences that exist between members of the same species. So what physical differences between you all. So looking around your classroom, for example, you should see loads of differences in terms of height, hair color, eye color, that sort of thing between everyone in the room. Now, variation is increased through sexual reproduction because it combines genes from separate parents. Because you get some genes from your mum, some genes from your dad, and that's why you'll look like a bit of a mix of them, because you're having two different genes or two different sets of genes being passed into you, making you a unique individual. So before we go on, there are two different types of variation that we need to know. They are called discrete and continuous variation. We're going to look at this first and look at examples of them. So first of all, discrete variation. There's differences in characteristics which are controlled by one single gene. So this is called single gene inheritance. So different types of discrete variation, they fall into distinct groups. You either look like something or you don't, or you have something or you don't. There's no range between you. You'd be able to divide up a room into these distinct groups due to discrete variation. So it makes a bit more sense if we look at some examples. So for example, eye colour. You either have brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, that sort of thing. It's not a range between them. You could divide people up into groups of eye colour very easily, and that's something you should maybe do in the classroom, for example. Another one would be, if you look at people's earlobes, you can have attached or unattached earlobes. If your earlobe goes directly into the side of your face, then that is attached. If it's not, it's unattached. So there's not a range between them. You either have attached or unattached earlobes. That's controlled by a single gene. That's why it's single gene inheritance, and that is a form of discrete variation. Another uh, bit more interesting one is earwax. So if you were to take a look at your earwax, you would find you either had wet earwax or you had dry earwax. So again, there's not a range, it's distinct groups. You have wet or dry, and that is controlled by a single gene. It is a form of discrete variation. So moving on to the next type of variation is continuous. So continuous is different in two ways. First of all, continuous variation, are there's still just differences, physical differences going on, but they are controlled by more than one gene. So this is known as polygenic inheritance. Polygenic just meaning many genes. These characteristics can actually just be divided up into groups. They can be measured and they have a range of values. So first example that we'll show you here is height, you're not either one height or another type of height. There's a range of height between people, say, in your class or in this picture here. You can see this continuous range going from small to tall that's controlled by many sorts of genes, so it's polygenic inheritance, and you can see the range going on that you can measure as well. So anything that you can measure would be a form of continuous variation. So for example, shoe size or feet length or something like that, those are controlled by more than one gene, they can be measured, they are not distinct groups, and therefore they are continuous variation. So first of all, before we go any further, we're going to have to look at some more terminology. We are going to be discussing genotypes and phenotypes of different organisms later on, and we need to know what that means. So first of all, your genotype is essentially the genes that you possess, and we're going to look at genes later on. So an individual's alleles for a particular characteristics would be their genotype. We're going to look at this alleles uh, next, so don't worry about that, we'll come on to that. Your phenotype is your, pheno your physical appearance, so it's what you look like, what those genes have caused you to look like for a particular characteristic. So the way I try and remember this is if you look at the pH on phenotype and you think of the pH in physical, that's a good way of remembering it. Genotype is your genes, phenotype is your physical appearance. So we talked about alleles a minute ago. So an allele is a different form of a gene which produces different phenotypes. So for example, your genetic information we've looked at before is stored in your genes, that's where your DNA is. So you could have an eye color gene, but the alleles determine what form of that gene you have. So you could have a blue eye color allele and another blue eye, blue eyed 
uh, allele coming from your parents, which will give you blue eyes, that sort of thing. Now, I know it's quite a lot of information getting thrown at you, but we're going to look at different forms of alleles and how they actually work in order to produce a phenotype, and it'll make a bit more sense to you then. So, there are two different forms of alleles, and they're quite easy to see the difference. So, dominant alleles always produce a certain phenotype. Think of dominant alleles as a strong form of allele. They always win over the other types of alleles. And you can tell if it's a dominant allele because they are represented by a capital letter. So in this case, I've given A, but it could be a B, it could be a T, it could be anything else. It's always a capital letter to show that that is a dominant form of the allele. And you'll be told what that actually represents as well. The other form of an allele, though, is called recessive. So in comparison to them, recessive is like a weaker form of the allele. Recessive alleles will not be shown in the phenotype, so they will not be expressed if a dominant allele is present because the dominant allele always wins. Again, you can tell the difference often quite easily because they are represented by a lowercase letter. So for example, in this one, we've been looking at capital A for a dominant allele. In this case, a lowercase a would show that it is recessive. So to compare them, again, some more terminology for you. If you look, you get you inherit two different alleles, so one for your mum and one for your dad for a certain characteristic. If they are both the same form of allele, so they are both dominant or they are both recessive, so in this case they are both capital A or they are both little a, then we call them homozygous. You would have homozygous alleles or homozygous genotype. Homo just meaning the same, so you can see that it's the same alleles for a gene. The difference though would be if you inherited a dominant allele and a recessive allele. We call that heterozygous, hetero meaning different. So straight away you can see a capital A, little a is heterozygous because they are both different. One is dominant, one is recessive, but in terms of what they express, the dominant one always wins. So even though that recessive allele is sort of hiding there, it will not actually be expressed, but it may come up in the next set of offspring, which is what we're going to look at. So we're going to start looking at how these alleles and how these genotypes and how these phenotypes all fit together and it will make things um, uh, hopefully uh, a bit easier to understand. So we're going to look at the colours of different pea plants. So this is something that Gregor Mendel studied. He first discovered these sort of laws of inheritance and genetics by comparing different colours, by comparing phenotypes and seeing what the offspring would be. So in this case, all you need to remember is we're going to use uh, a again as an allele. So capital A, of course, is dominant, is going to stand for purple, whereas a recessive little a is going to stand for white. We're going to go through one example here and then I suggest you pause the rest of the video and uh, try and do the rest of the calculations yourself just to check how you're doing. So in this example here, we have a purple pea plant and a white pea plant. So your phenotype, your physical characteristics, Hopefully you can tell that the phenotype for a purple pea plant would be purple, whereas the phenotype for the white pea plant would be white. So I'm going to give you the genotypes of these ones though, you'd always be given the genotype. You should hopefully know though, that in order for it to be purple, if capital A stands for purple and little a recessive stands for white, there are two different combinations. It could either be a homozygous dominant, capital A, capital A, or it could be heterozygous, with a capital A, little a because capital A, the dominant genotype, which stands for purple, would always win. In this case, it's homozygous dominant. It's capital A, capital A, fairly straightforward. For white though, there is only one form of genotype you could have to be white. You would have to have both recessive alleles inherited because if you had one dominant, it would win and you would be purple. So of course, in this case, it's little a, little a, which means it is a white pea plant. In terms of gametes, in terms of what can actually be passed on to the next generation, this one's quite simple. No matter which allele is chosen, they're both the same. So only capital A or dominant A or purple could be passed on to the offspring. Similarly for the white pea plant, recessive A is the only option there to be passed on. So how we actually have a look at what the potential genotypes and therefore phenotypes for the offspring could be is something called a Punnett square. So basically we use something called a monohybrid cross where we look at the genotype of the mother, the genotype of the father, we split it up into the alleles they can pass on and we match them together. So if we look at the top left just now, if we have a capital A from the father and a little a from the mother, you get capital A, little a. 
If you have capital E from the father and little e from the mother, then you get capital E, little e. And if you start matching these up, you can see in this case, capital E, little e is going to be the genotype that comes up no matter which way you go and swap or cross the gametes from the male and from the female. So in this case, the offspring, or what you can call the F1 genotype, is definitely going to be heterozygous. It's definitely going to be big A, little a, because there are no other combinations that the offspring could have, regardless of how the gametes get crossed. Which means if it is 100% likely that capital A, little a is going to be the genotype of the offspring, it means they will all be purple because dominance always wins. There's a capital A in the genotype, which means they will be purple. So hopefully that's made a bit of sense to you. We're going to go on to another example here with different genotypes. Once I've given the genotypes, I'll let you pause the video and try and do the rest on your own. So in this example, we're looking at purple pea plants again and white pea plants again. So we still have a purple phenotype and a white phenotype, but this time we're going to be a little bit different and we're going to have a heterozygous genotype for the purple pea plant. So although it still is purple, it still has the capital A, it still has the dominant allele, there's a little recessive allele has creeped in there as well. And the white pea plant obviously cannot change, it has to be homozygous recessive. So this time the gametes that can be passed on by the purple pea plant are either going to be capital A dominant or literally recessive. And with the white, a, white, with the white pea plant, only little a can be passed on. So again, if we do this Punnett square, it looks a little bit different this time. So starting from the top left, if you cross capital A and little a, you have capital A, little a, capital A, little a, and uh, little a there as well. If we don't move on to the recessive value from the father, this gives us a different sort of combination where we cross a little a and a little a, and a little a and a little a, which means our F1 genotype is going to be a ratio of two heterozygous and two homozygous recessive, which we can break down to one to one. So it means in this case, there's a 50% chance that the offspring of these two plants is going to have a capital A, little a heterozygous genotype, which would make it purple, or a 50% chance that it's going to have little a, little a, homozygous recessive, which would mean that it is white. So in this case, 50% chance of being purple, 50% chance of being white. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the likelihoods of what the phenotype is going to be from the offspring. So let's look at one more here. This one is a little bit different, where we have a purple pea plant and a purple pea plant. So obviously, your phenotype is going to be purple and purple, and your genotype is going to be heterozygous, capital A, little a, and heterozygous, capital A, little a as well, which means both the dominant and the recessive forms of the allele can be passed on to the offspring. So have a go at Punnett Square and see what the offspring could potentially have in their genotype and what that actually means for their phenotype as well. So hopefully if you've had a look at this, this one's a bit different because you have two heterozygous parents being crossed together. In this case, if you cross the dominant A and dominant A, then you get homozygous dominant. You cross the dominant A and the recessive A, you get heterozygous dominant. If you cross the capital A and little a, capital A, little a, and your final combination there is the two recessive alleles, which give you homozygous recessive. So there's quite a range here of different genotypes that the offspring could have. So in this case, you could have either, uh, there's a 25% chance of them having a homozygous dominant uh, genotype, there is a 50% chance of them having a heterozygous genotype, and there is a 25% chance of having a homozygous recessive genotype. So quite a mix going on there. However, what you should hopefully notice in terms of the phenotype is that you get a bit of a different ratio going on because there'd be a 75% chance of being purple and a 25% chance of being white, a sort of three to one ratio when it comes to phenotype. And that's because regardless if the offspring inherits the capital A, capital A, or the capital A, little a, that's still going to be purple. Because remember, in heterozygous, dominance always wins. It means that capital A, even though there is a recessive allele, it'll still be purple. The only chance of that offspring being recessive is the final combination we looked at, the homozygous recessive, little a, little a. So that is the, the full uh, form of inheritance that we look at in terms of monohybrid crosses. 
And the last thing we need to know is these ratios that we've just looked at will not always work out perfectly. And the question you will often get is why would you not, why can you not say that they will definitely have uh, a 25% chance of being white? If you have four offspring, are they all going to perfectly match the ratios that you set? The answer is no, because offspring will not always follow the expected ratio because fertilization is random. And that bit in bold is really important. The reason behind that is that you cannot predict which sperm and egg or pollen and ovule are going to fertilize together. So although things will follow that uh, four different types of genotype, that is the, the likelihood of what they will get. It could be that although there's a one in four chance of being white, it could be every time they are homozygous recessive, just entirely by chance because fertilization is random. So that is variation and inheritance. So you need to know your different forms of variation. You need to know how they are inherited by single gene or polygenic inheritance. You need to know all these different terms of your phenotype, genotype, alleles, recessive, dominant, homozygous, heterozygous, and work your way through parents and uh, offspring generations. And you need to know that why phenotype ratios among offspring are not always achieved perfectly because fertilization is random. So it's quite a challenging bit of a key area, but hopefully you'll get the hang of it for going through this video. I've attached our quizzes of some questions, mostly to do with terminology, that will hopefully help you out. So hopefully you understand this one and you're getting on well with the unit so far, and we will continue on with unit two very soon. Thank you very much for listening, folks.